It's always good, isn't it, to see families in God. I think that certainly in our nation, we desperately need to see more. Well, we did get that thing to work earlier. It looks like it's going to be point and shoot up the back there. Just hit the down button. Elohim, Kore, Vayikanu Ami, Asher Nikrash Mi Alehem, Vayit Palelu, Vayavakshu Fanai, Vayashu Vumidar Hehem Haraim. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people. Father, just let your word Work in us this morning to accomplish your purpose, to prosper, Lord, in, in our heart and life in Jesus' name. We are looking last time at, uh, at Solomon and the last recorded conversation that he had with God. And God asked, what if I send a drought? What if the, the food chain falls apart? Or if there's an epidemic, a plague, what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to get this thing to work now. Brilliant. Okay. So what do you do then, Solomon? You see, there was a three-sided problem. And it had a five-sided solution. And with that went a three-sided blessing. Now, I want you to remember that nothing that God does or says is ever inconsequential. Therefore, every part of this promise is significant. And I think it's important for us to remember the fact that now this passage of Scripture is quite familiar to us. And it's so familiar that sometimes we just fly over the top. So because it's familiar, it doesn't mean that we've got the liberty just to flit over it and, and treat it as very little more than, than a memory verse of some sort. I'll find the right spot. There we go. You know, we learn memory verses in, in Sunday school or whatever. It's one of the things that I think is really sad, and this is just an aside in in the generation in which we live. We've got so much and we've got such a, a multiplicity of, of Bibles available to us. The problem with it, when, when I was a kid, we really, it was King Jim. All right, that was it. Everybody had the same. And that meant that when we learnt memory verses, we all learned it from the same Bible. And so we'd all say it together and all this sort of stuff, you know. In the early charismatic movement, we used our Bibles as our songbooks. Some of you remember those days. But these days when we've got so many different Bible translations, it's hard to get people to learn a verse. But what God says is he wants us to hide his word in our heart. And so it is good to learn memory verses. And it's good to learn scriptures, not just in Sunday school. It's good for all of us to, to learn more of the Word of God. But the problem with a memory verse is that it just becomes a verse. It just becomes a, a thing. Nothing much more than, than Shakespeare to us. It's just a statement. But I think that this verse is familiar because it's often quoted. And it's often quoted because it has uncompromising importance. First of all, God says, suppose as a nation or as a body of people, you find yourself suffering from some of the trials that, that he described. 
and you know that the trials, these tests, the, the things that have come upon you ha have come upon us because of disobedience. What can you do? What can you do about it? And I'm suggesting that what the Bible tells us here is that there are five conditions that we need to meet. Five conditions that we need to meet. And when we do that, then what happens is that God says there are three things that he's going to do. And this is a perfect example of a conditional covenant. You know, we've talked about unconditional and conditional covenants. So it's the if you do, then I will. Okay, it's a perfect example of it. Now let's take a look at some of them, some of these conditions that have to be met. First up, condition number one, you must be qualified. Qualified? You've got to be qualified in this sense. You must be one of God's own people. Solomon, God was saying to him, here is the first prerequisite. If my people, if my people who are called by my name. One of the most amazing realities of the Bible is that the fact is the fact that the God of eternity, the God of creation, the God who made heaven and earth, the one who simply spoke and the worlds came into being, that he called out a people to be his. That is, he selected from all of the people on the earth, he selected one nation from among the nations, and literally he adopted them into his eternal family. He made them special. He made them distinct, set apart by their national entity. Each individual distinctly belonged to God. His person uh, and the nation corporately, God called his called out or chosen people, chosen to represent him on planet earth. If my people, my people, of all of the people on earth, only the Hebrew people were called my people. God himself refers to this people as my people so many times. We find an example in Exodus 3. I have seen the affliction of my people, he said to Moses. In Jeremiah, he mourned, my people have forgotten me. And again in Jeremiah 24, I will give them a heart to know me and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. My people. Over and over again. Remember the, the command that uh, Moses was to take to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Let my people go. So this is a, a message for God's people. The message that God gave to Solomon was a message for God's people. Now, you simply can't take every Old Testament promise made to Israel and apply it to the church. You just can't do that. Some people like to try, but it doesn't work. Many Old Testament promises were made specifically to Israel, and they ended there. They were fulfilled. Some were made to ethnic Israel. Some only to a certain generation of people that lived at the time when the promise was spoken. Now, many prophecies also had multiple fulfillments, and we understand that. But many promises that God made were specifically made to my people, the people of God. These were the promises that God gave to the people, to the family of God. And they were meant to be claimed by Israel and when the time came by the church. The church was ushered in and we were grafted into these promises as the spiritual seed of Abraham and the promises were then applied to each believer and that was given at the moment that we became a new creation in him. When we became God's sons and daughters, we became his people. 
And so we can take these promises that God has made to his people and we can stand on them. The old hymn was standing on the promises. The trouble is the church has been sitting on the premises instead. (laughs) And we need to stand on the promises. We need to understand that God has given us promises and they are ours. But in the case of this particular promise, we know from the context and and its application that it was written to anyone who could accurately be called my people. Anyone who, who according to scripture at any time could be referred to as the people of God. In Romans 9, Paul builds the bridge for us, if you like, that allows the church to walk into the sunlight of, of these promises that God made for his people. God, in that sense, redefined my people. He extended it so it was not only ethnic Israel, but also became the church as well. My people who are called by my name, who are called by the name of Jesus. And Paul, writing about the church in 2 Corinthians 6, said this, uh, added these words regarding the church, I will dwell in them and walk in them and be their God and they shall be my people. And it's, it's mirroring, it's absolutely mirroring the, the promise that was made to ethnic Israel. And this was made clearly to the church. So you and I who have been born into the family of God, we are ones who constitute God's family, his people called by his name. So that phrase applies to us. That name which is above every name. The name that the Bible says before which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The promise was for Israel certainly and the promise is for us as well. However, It's one of those conditional promises. There's conditions. And God is saying when a nation or a people um, put God out of their their national conscience and consciousness and begin to worship the gods of this world, whatever they might be at the time, the gods of the world in Solomon's time were idols. The gods of the world in our time are things like money and power. And when a nation or a group of people put their trust in the gods of this world, trusting in things, trusting in man's ability basically to save, trusting in in treasure and pleasure, trusting that these things will deliver them from the reality of sin and compromise and so forth. Whenever this happens... If God's people, if God's people, those ones who bear his name, those ones who are called by my name, if my people, then something's going to happen. If we get these conditions, something's going to happen. When God's people meet these these four basic requirements, heaven is going to touch earth. Now, I believe that we can have heaven touching earth. We can have heaven really working in our lives and touching the world around us. It's all very well to say, well, heaven is in my heart. Well, that's very good for you. I'm glad it's there. It's in my heart too. But we've got to make sure we don't just keep it in there. We've got to get it out there. Heaven's got to touch the rest of the earth. If my people who are called by my name. So that horizon, that, that, that dark horizon that's in a, in a sense clouded by the judgments that, that hover over a rebellious people. They can be turned to experience the glory and the brightness of God breaking through. Disobedience sinfulness, godlessness, bring that cloud, bring that separation. But if my people, if my people, something is going to happen. So the first condition is if, if you are God's people. So there's condition number one, 
if you are God's people. And I want to suggest to you this morning, if you know Jesus, then you meet condition number one. <coughs> Trouble is, that's the easy one. <laughs> and as soon as we get to condition number two, it gets hard. If my people, notice the very first thing that God put in there, if my people will humble themselves. I reckon he put the hardest one in first. To humble yourself, though, does not mean to disregard who you are and to walk about apologetically as though being one of God's people is a passport to being anonymous, a passport to being left out of things. Now, we talked last time about being in the world, and it's good. We are. We live in the world. As long as the world doesn't live in us, it's not a bad thing. Uh, up at um, Glen Innes last week, I used the illustration of um, when years ago, for just a matter of oh, about nine or ten months, I worked in one of the hardest parts of the public service in, in the Department of Immigration in this particular little thing. Um, you know a little bit about it, Ted. Um, but we used to go out and meet the, the vessels out at sea uh, when we were told that there were certain problems with a number of people. Depending on the number, it'd be where we'd, how far out we'd have to go. Sometimes we'd go to Perth and come all the way around. And sometimes, and most of the time, it would just be boarding off Sydney. If the weather was rough, we'd go on the customs launch and board just inside the heads. If it was fine, we'd go out in the pilot's vessel out to sea. And uh, it was always an interesting thing because I couldn't swim. As I used to say, I could swim the f full depth of the ocean. <laughs> and when that, when that boat would come up alongside, our little launch would come up alongside the ship, who hadn't really slowed down all that much, it was still ploughing through the water, you'd bump into the side with a big rubber um, thing between you and the, and, and the, and the ship, and you had to listen for the master of your little vessel to say, next. And as soon as he spoke, you didn't need to have a look. You just could step out and you knew you'd be stepping onto something solid. If he played a trick on you, you were in big trouble. Because <laughs> you had to take his word. One of the things that I knew about that little vessel was that it was made to be in the water. And it was okay to be in the water. That's where it was meant to be. It was made, it was designed to live in the water. But I knew that it would not be a good thing if the water got into the boat. Matter of fact, I knew it would be a very bad thing. The more that got in, the worse it would be and the greater the danger. And that's the same principle by which we live. We are in the world. We run into problems when the world starts getting into us. We were made to be in the world, but we were not made for the world to be in us. But let's understand this. When the Bible talks about a Christian being humble, God's people being humble, it does not mean that we are doormats. It doesn't mean that we just... Bow down and let people do whatever they want. There are times God's people have got to stand up strong. And that's not being proud. That's not being unhumble. It's just standing up for the things that are right. God's people have power. And we must not forget that. Humility is not the opposite of power. God's people have power. God's people have hope. God's people have freedom. We have those things that the world desperately wants. So humility is not tied down to being powerless and bound up by religious conditions and rules. It's not... Uh, bound up uh, by sadness and, and boring lives and so forth. Matter of fact, we are the salt of the earth. And one of the things, 
I always find it interesting, but I've said this here so you know the answer, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, but it's always interesting when, when you ask people, what does salt do? Most people will get, tell you all the things. It cleans um, and goes on through, all, all these sort of things. Occasionally somebody will tell us that, that it stings, and it does, and it can. But the thing that most people leave out is that it makes you horribly thirsty. And it does. And I want to tell you, as Christians, if we are the salt of the earth, we should be making people thirsty for what we've got. <laughs> we should be making people thirsty for God. And that is not going to achieve by being a doormat. That's going to be achieved by exhibiting freedom, by exhibiting joy, by exhibiting life, by exhibiting the power of God in us. So understand, humility is not the opposite of those things. I mean, why on earth would we want to be apologetic? For having freedom and joy and peace. We are the light of the world. Are we to hide the light through embarrassment? No, that's not humility. That's false humility. Totally false humility. And false humility will keep you from your destiny in God. Will keep you from achieving what God wants you to have. The word humble, the word that is translated humble into the English language, literally has a meaning that, that gives a better picture of what God has in mind for us. It means to be subdued or to come under subjection to another. It, it, it carries the sense of, of bringing the proud or, or recalcitrant spirit into subjection to something or to someone. It's used in the military sense. A person is humble before their superior officer. In other words, they're obedient. They submit. They're brought under its authority or control. Can, can you understand that? When a, um, a, a captain says to a private, jump, he does not expect the private to stand there with his hands in his pocket and say, Why? He expects him to ask how high on the way up, doesn't he? That is being humble in this context. It is the word that, or it is a word that, that, donate, that, that, that denotes um, one coming to an end of, of our self and throwing ourselves in a reckless abandonment to God himself. It's an attitude of, of remorse for sin. An attitude of regret over pride. It's an attitude that cries out, we are not the ones who can, but I know someone that can. I, can. I belong to the God who can. I can introduce you to the one who can. I can't heal you, but I know someone that can. Amen. And he's with me. All right? That's actually humility. In a biblical sense. Okay, so can we understand that? Now in 2 Chronicles uh, 34, the people's heart, the Bible says, was soft when they heard God's word. It, it, was, it was so soft that at the mention of God's holiness, they understood, they perceived their wickedness and they, they wept in the presence of their, their God and creator. That was humility. That was humility. Humility is an acknowledgement that apart from God, we can do nothing. It is only in and through him. Now the church in every generation, I believe, has reached a Solomon stage. A stage at which true humility has been replaced by religious activity, by by religious competition even, by religious rules and regulations. And we begin to be impressed by the contribution that we make to the kingdom. We think we're pretty good. God spoke to me last night. <laughs> I'm pretty important, you know. No. Without God, I 
have nothing. He must increase, I must decrease. That's the way it works. But we begin to be, to be awed by the sense of, of what we have. How much wealth the church has. I said some time ago, it's a long time since the church could say silver and gold have I none. But it's also been a long time since the church could say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Because we've learned to rely on our stuff instead of relying on his. And that was the problem that Solomon was, was facing. Subtly things begin to mean more to us than they ought to. We begin to subtly put our confidence in what we can do for God rather than what God can do for us. Haven't you ever stopped and wondered sometimes how God survived before you came along? <laughs> now, come on, at some point we probably all have. We've all given God counsel and our wisdom. We become impressed with who we are. And we've got to remember, without him, we have nothing. That's what humility is about, about submitting to God. And when we are in that position of humility, we have all of those things that could make us proud. So it's an attitude that we need to adopt. We build the, the altars of, of gods, if you like, in the world, building programs and, and so forth. And, and we, we do all of these things. And somehow we leave God out. The church can become arrogant and self-satisfied and self-seeking and self-serving. And that has been the history of the Christian church, sadly, over the centuries. And it's all done in the name of Jesus. Well, what God tells us is that we are not only to love justice and be people of mercy, but we are to walk humbly with our God. This is a fundamental thing that God requires of us. What does the Lord require of you? Well, if you don't know anything else, understand this. To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And we, we need to fall before him until we get that true picture that we are totally and absolutely dependent upon God. We need to be reminded of that often to avoid us becoming self-sufficient or even arrogant before God. God can do nothing for us or in us while we think we can do it all. By humbling ourselves, it's an attitude that precedes an activity in this sense. For the activity to be, to be successful and acceptable, the attitude has to be acceptable. And the attitude is humility. Abandonment at the feet of God by a people who constantly need him. If my people will humble themselves. Condition number three, pray. The word translated pray here is a, a word that, that appears about 85 or so times uh, in the Old Testament. And it can be translated in a, a, a few different ways. Let's just have a look very quickly at them. To invoke God as judge. To break oneself, to be contrite before God. To settle an account. You say, this is prayer? To seek a proper assessment of a matter. And this is actually the word that's used, that's translated pray, in this context. You see, humility removes ourselves from the, from the bench, if you like, uh, takes us off the throne, and we fall before God, and we, we bring to him our, ourselves as we are, and our needs as they are. We acknowledge his kingship and authority. And prayer is the act of consciously appearing before the true judge in that condition of dependence. Acknowledging that he alone is God. He is Lord. 
And in that spirit, we ask him to settle an issue or solve a problem. It's the way that we come before him. Now, as I said, prayer is not instructing God of, of how to do things. We all would like it on occasions. It's the prayer we've been waiting for, the answer from God that we've always wanted when God says, I don't know, what do you think I should do? I don't know what to do. Because we're waiting to give him counsel, aren't we? But that's not the way we come in prayer. Prayer is, is not a man bringing God into harmony with man's will. We don't pray with the object of getting God to comply with what we want. When there's a problem, guess who's going to change? Sometimes we don't like it. There's an old saying that I use a lot, and it says, if the cat doesn't being liked, stroked the wrong way, let the cat turn round. <laughs> you see, that's the way it works. And we're not going to change the way that God is stroking the cat. <laughs> and if you lie, don't like it, well... Hey, turn around. Turn around. God's not going to pat the other way. He's not going to comply with your will. We've got to comply with his. And we come in that deep spirit of dependence, seeking to, to determine what is the will and the mind and the purpose of God so that we can walk humbly in that will. Condition four. Seek my face. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. This is not an idea of, of just casually glancing around to see if someone was there. It's, it's a matter of, of seeking, of looking like one would, would look for, would seek hidden treasure. Whenever kids have played hide and seek, they search, they look, they're wanting to find something. It is, in this sense, a self-abandoning search for something or someone that is precious, priceless, and there's nothing that should prevent us finding it. We are going to keep searching until we find the treasure. So that's what seeking him is. But what about seeking his face? An interesting word. Again, when you dig in and find out what some of these words are, the face of God that's translated face 2100 times in the Old Testament. It's that which identifies someone by, by the distinct reflection, if you like, of character of that person. Now let's explain exactly what, what I mean here. It carries this sense of, of a face-to-face -face encounter. But what you are seeing is the character of the person. It's not just a matter of seeing the image. When you seek the face of somebody in this context, you're not looking at the eyes and the nose and the mouth. You're looking at the heart. You're looking at the character of the individual. It's not just a casual conversation when we seek the face of God. We're touching his character. And scripture tells us that his face shines. But it also tells us that there are occasions where he hides his face. Which is a sad thing. That which reflects his character or nature to man. To seek God's face is to remain before him until you understand more of his character than you knew before. Yeah. Until you actually begin to reflect that character yourself in ever increasing glory. It's wanting to reflect his, his character in your character. It is knowing him, seeking his faces, is knowing him. And, and nothing short of that level of encounter with the king will ultimately change our life or change the course of history. And history's course needs changing now in this 21st century in which we live. 
Knowing God has not become the, the priority of the church in this generation. We have more technology and psychology and theology than any generation before us. But often I, I would say that as I look around the church across the planet, so much of the church does not know God. They don't know God. So the technology is, is sterile and impotent. The psychology is humanistic. The theology is confused. A God who can heal, but it seems would rather want to watch you suffer than intervene. What God is that? It's not the God of the Bible, but it is the God of much of the church. No wonder we're seeing what I describe as an influx of the world's mentality into the church because we don't seek his face and, and know his character and nature. Rather, we try and make him like us. Condition number five, turn from their wicked ways. Turn. Repent. It's one of the most frequent words used in Scripture. It's used by Jeremiah over a hundred times alone. It's basically the act of, of consciously ordering our direction. Whatever the course might have been that was unacceptable to God, we immediately reject it and turn around so we can adopt his will and his purpose and direction. So here's God's prerequisites. If my people, my people, my called apart ones, those who bear the name of my son, will see their absolute dependence on me and, and call to me, not instructing me, but rather asking me to give my plan for their lives and reflect upon who I am until they become as I am. And if they see me for who I am and turn from their ways, God's saying, I will respond. I will respond. So how does he respond? First up, he says he's going to hear from heaven Forgive their sin and heal their land. We're going to walk in the blessings of God. There will be such answers to prayer that a nation can begin to respond to the things of the Spirit. In that sense, we can say that heaven can speak and the earth can tremble. And what it takes is God's people. God's people, you and me. <coughs> The church needs to understand who we are today in Christ. And our character needs to, to reflect that character of God more and more and more. And as we do that, I believe we'll see healing within our nation. Physically, morally, spiritually, emotionally, the, the sin of disease or the, the, the disease of sin will be will be broken, will be stopped by what we could describe as the, the mighty penicillin, if you like, of God's word and life flowing through his people. God's mercy can overcome and overtake our nation once again. The locusts that have eaten the fibre of our nation can be put back and God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The pestilence that, that has corrupted and infected the body of God's people can be driven from amongst his people by the, the power of, of holiness. And when the world sees the church, they'll be seeing him and be attracted to him. The church can be returned to its place as the centre of life. The church should be making history, not responding to it. Christians should be characterised by godliness rather than by the different theologies that we might have to another Christian. The church should be known by what it gives rather than what it takes. And rather than holding on to the ropes that that surround the ship of life 
so we don't fall into the, to the deep. We can be the people who turn the world upside down. Does it need the whole church, everyone, all over the planet? No. I believe it can start with just a bunch of us fulfilling the requirement that God has given. And that's the message that God gave to Solomon on that dark night just after he had so astounded the nation of Israel with his presence at the, at the temple. He wants us to turn the world upside down. But the, void, the word that he gave to Solomon on that day was, Solomon, you've got a choice. And because Solomon had the choice, the nation had the choice. Solomon, he was saying, you are in deep trouble here. But there is a way of escape. If my people, and God is saying, at any time, when my people come into harmony with my plan and purpose, then again they will be infused with the power any time that happens. Heaven is going to touch earth again. God will be exalted. Sin will be judged. Lives will, will become brightened again with the glory of God. If my people. It isn't the politicians who are going to save Australia. It isn't the economists or the sociologists or the psychologists or the journalists or the ideologists. Remember what we asked last time about Sodom and Gomorrah. What was it that saved, would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah? Just the presence of righteousness. The amount of sin that was there, it would still have been saved if there'd been some righteous people. If my people. So the presence of a righteous people can change the destiny of a nation. But it all comes down to one word. If, if, and it's one of those terrible things that nobody can decide but you. Solomon couldn't decide it for the nation. I can't decide it for the church. Parents can't decide it for their children. Each individual, one of his people, have to come to that point. Humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. Turn around from our own ways. And then we'll hear from heaven. We'll find forgiveness of sins and healing in our land. And God, indeed, will truly be glorified. And I must admit, we'll have a good time as well. <laughs> Let's pray. Father... Your people. You set the conditions out pretty simply. And Lord, no matter how hard they are, we look at them and we say, boy, the reward of obedience is far greater than the reward of, the reward of disobedience. We can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But Lord, we can enjoy the benefits of holiness forever. So Lord, help us not to invest in the things that corrupt and pass away, but help us to invest in that which is eternal and help our hearts to respond to your word that you might accomplish in us that which you desire and we will see our nation touched in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got some needs this morning, please don't take them away with you. The prayer team had some words. Um, somebody with a, a, a painful left ankle and uh, a young person um, wanting uh, to see God's creativity. Someone lonely um, on the left-hand side of the church. There you go. That's very specific. Um, somebody needing provision with finances. Um, 
What's this one here, George? Martyrdom, is it? Somebody feeling martyred, or uh, uh, somebody, f somebody uh, feeling uh, that sense of mar <coughs> right? Okay. Someone crying out to to God. Um, somebody uh, trapped uh, in social media isolation, and somebody wanting greater unity in their marriage and rest in the Lord, and somebody wanting a f something fresh from God. Look, if any of those apply to you, please let the prayer team um, pray with you. If you've got any other need, they'll be happy to pray with you as well. So let's just have a song and then we'll close off. <laughs>